Welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Listen weekday mornings to Ken and Matt on the WGAN Morning News. Eggs and Issues is supported by presenting sponsors, Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, and Unum, in cooperation with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, First Light Fiber, and Wex. And now, please welcome Portland Community Chamber of Commerce President, Jack Lufkin. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Eggs and Issues. As you just heard, my name is Jack Lufkin, and I'm the volunteer president of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. We are thrilled to have here with us today the Gulf of Maine Research Institute's president and CEO, Don Perkins, who will be discussing, among other things, some of the challenges and opportunities in the Gulf of Maine. But before we get to Don's presentation, I'd like to take a minute to talk about last week's election. Uh, many of you were here a month ago to hear Dana Totman and Britt Vitellius speak about Portland's question one and two. Uh, they would have been extremely harmful to the growth in our city and our, in our region. And from the results, it's obvious that the message was heard. And that didn't happen by uh, coincidence. <clears throat> that happened by a lot of hard work by a lot of uh, individuals, many of whom are in the room tonight, uh, excuse me, this morning. Uh, Britt Vitellius in the Say No to, to Question One campaign uh, ran a excellent, in my opinion, education campaign, and, and again, the election results spoke for themselves. In addition, uh, Question Two would have been, as you know, very detrimental for zoning changes in Portland, and uh, Heather Sanborn of Rising Tide and, and Jess Knox uh, had a campaign, Quincy Hensel, uh, our CEO was on the steering committee, as you probably read in the paper. The chamber felt it was so important that we actually contributed money. We got engaged in this issue, and we hope you agree that by uh, educating the voters and defeating that uh, NIMBY uh, ordinance, uh, we're all better off uh, in our mission of growth and prosperity. So uh, a thank you to, uh, to Quincy, to Heather, Jess, Britt, and everyone who worked on those campaigns. We're very pleased with the results. Um, in addition, we have with us here this morning uh, a couple of uh, uh, counselors. And I want to thank uh, them for attending. Uh, Councillor Dusan, who won her re-election bid to the City Council. <clears throat> we also have uh, Councilman Brennerman, who will be retiring, uh, and we thank him for his dedicated service. And last but certainly not least, we have uh, the councilwoman-elect Kim Cook, who has been voted into office to replace David Brennerman, and we look forward to working with her on the Portland City Council. Congratulations, all. <laughs> the last thing that I want to just make sure everyone is aware of, um, as you know, the chamber is, is uh, engaging a, little, a lot more in advocacy and educating the business community. Uh, the mayor has proposed a mandatory paid time off policy. This was heard last night uh, for the first time at the Health and Human Services Committee. If you have uh, a business or if you represent a business, you're going to want to get engaged. You're going to want to read the ordinance. Your HR managers are going to want to be um, uh, conversant on, on what's being proposed. As always, you can look to the chamber to be uh, advocating for your behalfs as, uh, as it relates to this policy. So more to come on that, and it's just at the very beginning stages of that. So um, now the next thing I want to do is talk about uh, our annual event. Uh, as many of you remember from last year, our annual event is a celebration of Portland and the region, a glimpse into the future growth and development and an award show focused on individuals and organizations that are fostering growth and innovation. I would like to formally invite everyone here to attend. This year's event will be held January 24th at Brick South on Thompson's Point. Keep an eye out for a formal invitation, but in the meantime, you can register at our chamber website. We would also like to announce a new hire here at the Portland Regional Chamber. Uh, Tommy Johnson started this week as the Director of Membership and Events where he will help coordinate events such as Kegs and Issues and the Imagine Portland event. He will also be assisting the chamber with membership and retention, so I'm sure you'll be seeing quite a bit of him in the months to come. 
Please join me in welcoming Tommy Johnson. <clears throat> it is no secret that we would not be able to bring you eggs and issues without the generous support of our sponsors, so I'd like to take a minute to thank those. Our presenting sponsors are Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, Unum, and our cooperating sponsors, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, WEX, First Light, our reception sponsor is Clark Insurance and Key Bank, our parking, parking sponsor, Packin, <laughs> Packin sponsor uh, is uh, CV and Mahar Engineers. Sorry, I let my scout get out. So, <laughs> CV and Mahar Engineers, we thank them for that. And Headlight Audio Visual provides us with our overall production support. Um, our uh, print sponsor is The Forecaster. Uh, our e-media partner is MainBiz. And WGAN is our radio sponsor who interviews our speakers and broadcasts live here every month. And WMTW-TV serves as our broadcast sponsor. We also want to thank our special community partners. They are Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Spectrum Healthcare, Oxford Casino, the University of Southern Maine and Southern Maine Community College. We also want to thank AAA in Northern New England and Springborn Staffing to support our Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs program, which allows area high school and college students to attend Eggs and Issues. This month, we are pleased to have students from Southern Maine Community College, Chevris, Gorham High School, Baxter Academy, and Greeley High School. If you're in the audience and you wouldn't mind standing, and let us thank you for being here today. Baker, Newman & Noyes sponsors our Community Corner program, which allows area nonprofits to promote their organizations at Eggs and Issues. This month, we are highlighting Toys for Tots. Toys for Tots was started in 1947 by Major Bill Hendricks. Major Hendricks, along with five other Marines, collected and distributed 5,000 toys to war orphans and underprivileged children throughout Los Angeles, California. The Marine Corps adopted the program and in 1948 made it a reserve run program. The mission, provide every children with a little Christmas. Every toy donated in Maine stays in Maine. Every dollar donated in Maine goes toward a toy for a child in Maine. Last year we collected and distributed over 46,000 toys to over 16,000 children. We will pass that number this year, but we cannot do it alone. This is about the community coming together to take care of their own, which no one does better than Maine. With us today from Toys for Tots, we have Staff Sergeant Drew Robertson, Unit Coordinator, Staff Sergeant Dave Burt, Assistant Coordinator and Corporal Keith Roy, Assistant Coordinator. If you would just stand for a moment and be recognized, thank you. An important part of Eggs and Issues each month is recognizing our new chamber members. If there are new and returning members with us today, please stand and be recognized. And now on to our presentation. Just as a reminder, we, there will be a question answer session after uh, Don's remarks. And you can tweet questions using our hashtag eggs and issues. If you'd like to ask a question, we do ask that you please use the microphones. There are two in the room. Uh, please tell us your name and your organization before you ask your question. Don Perkins has led the Gulf of Maine Research Institute's evolution from a startup vision to an internationally recognized research education and community organization. He also serves in the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation Board, Maine Innovation Economy Advisory Board, and the MMG Insurance Board. Don holds a BA from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Don to the stage.
Good morning, everybody. Getting, getting used to the light here. Um, can we have the slides? Oh, I guess I have to go to, oops, sorry. All right. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us this morning. Jack, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, here in the Gulf of Maine, uh, and I'm going to do it in, in three parts. Uh, the first is I'm going to talk a little, just a little bit about our history. Uh, the, the chamber uh, really was the incubator uh, for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. In 1994 and 95, uh, I shared an office, uh, a windowless office, with Hil Phil Helgerson. Uh, it was smaller than this stage uh, in the bowels of the chamber, and it, but for the chamber, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I'm going to give a little bit of a historical update. Then I'm going to shift to the question of climate change, because it's a, it's a defining issue for us here in the Gulf of Maine. And then on to the opportunity, which is aquaculture. So the Gulf of Maine Research Institute has been an evolving idea uh, since the late 60s. Uh, if you note just above the ferry boat on the left, uh, there's a glass wraparound on the Cumberland Coal Storage Building, now Pierce Atwood. Once upon a time, we had a letter of intent to lease that building to, to build an aquarium there. In the late 90s, we acquired the property we're on uh, now. Uh, it took two acts of Congress uh, and leadership from Senator Snow, uh, uh, Representative uh, um, uh, Tom Allen, uh, and, and then uh, uh, Senator, Senator Collins. And it, it, took an, it took 10 years to put this property together. We designed an aquarium with the same architects that designed the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which is arguably one of the great aquariums in the world. Uh, and then um, as we got into the 2000s, the idea of research started to surface. That there was not an entity here in Maine that was strategically focused on the Gulf of Maine as both an economic engine and a really precious ecosystem to be stewarded. And so we ended up uh, focusing on that niche very much with the encouragement of, of then um, Governor King. Uh, uh, with his support, we were part of the first R&D bond in 1998, and it was really that state support that, that got us going in terms of building um, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which, which we broke ground on in, in 2003. In two, 2003, uh, invisible to the community in many ways, uh, we raised $17 million, $17 million, uh, with leadership from the corporate community. We, we have, uh, you all out here uh, and your predecessors, have been extraordinarily supportive of our effort. Uh, of particular note, Nestle Waters has, has been supporting us for 11 years now, making it possible for students to come to us from all over uh, the state of Maine. Uh, Unum, uh, with its deep commitment to education, has been uh, really seminal in, in the development of our education programs. Uh, the Hannaford Charitable Foundation has been very generous, and, and they've worked with us very closely on developing our sustainable seafood program, and are really on the forefront uh, nationally in that regard. And then um, Iberdrola, USA, and CMP have been supportive every step of the way uh, with supporting kids from around the state and recent, recently giving us a piece of property where the dive shop is next door. And there's 170 other companies from all over Maine who have been, been similarly generous. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. We've also had tremendous support from the foundation community, local foundations that many of you know, regional foundations in Boston and, and New York, and the technology foundations uh, out on the West Coast, the Hewlett Foundation, the Packard Foundation, the Moore Foundation. And that's really a signal that we've been able to emerge as a nationally relevant and highly competitive organization over the last 10 years. And then we've had 160-odd people from around uh, uh, Greater Portland serve on our board. And, and as you all know, um, uh, boards of directors are really the, 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 the folks that help make an organization like us uh, get up on its feet uh, with their time and their, their financial support. And so we, we've really been a, we're very much a, a, a product of this community and, and we're forever grateful for that. And so here we are today. <clears throat> um, we have a, we have a world-class research institution. Our mission is to pioneer collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. That the problems we're grappling with here are global in nature. The things we learn here are relevant and exportable elsewhere. We have 65 staff. Uh, we have an annual budget of about $11 million a year. Uh, we're well diversified across federal uh, science agency uh, uh, foundations, corporate support, individual support. Uh, and so it's quite an organization. We have three core commitments. The first is to science. Uh, we, have an we have an internationally recognized interdisciplinary research team. 
uh, who looks at, at problems from a systems point of view. Uh, when you're looking at the overfishing of cod, or why are lobsters so abundant, or what's the impact of climate, you have to think about it from a biological point of view, an economic point of view, a policy point of view, uh, and, and we're quite unique in that kind of focus. We have a deep commitment to education, particularly the idea of, of supporting Maine's emergence as a science literate state. We're focused on middle school students. We have a very high tech virtual research environment in the lab where we see between nine and 10,000 students, nine and 10,000 students from 70% of the state's middle schools. Doesn't matter whether a kid woke up this morning down in Eastport, up in Fort Kent, over in Falmouth, um, they all get here uh, free of charge. We provide the busing because the point is to give kids an opportunity and to raise their aspirations. And then our third major commitment is on the community side. We're deeply involved in communities up and down the coast of Maine and, and really throughout New England uh, with what are the particular challenges of Portland versus Rockland versus Gloucester. We start out on the water working with fishermen as research partners. We're active in the regulatory arena providing technical advice. And we work in the supply chain with, with processors with grocery chains like Hannaford Brothers um, and with institutional uh, food providers like Sodexo. Over the next few years, you'll see us uh, extend in, in five areas. One is to broaden our, our access with the public beyond uh, middle school kids, focusing on, on younger kids and high school kids uh, through partnerships. A second, uh, which we'll get, get into more deeply, is, is really driving the growth of our seafood economy, uh, sustaining our uh, remarkable lobster resource, supporting the, the resurgence of ground fish, and, uh, and the point today really driving the aquaculture opportunity. A new area for us is that we're, we're starting to work with individual communities along the coast, South Portland, Portland, Machias, on, on how do you make sense of the challenge of climate change? When you look out over the next 50 or 100 years, what, 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 do you, what do you set yourself up to deal with? A three-foot rise in sea level, a six-foot rise in sea level? These are profound challenges that we're going to have to reckon with along this coast. We're getting involved in, in attracting investment uh, into the sustainable seafood supply chain. And last but not least, we're starting to extend our reach uh, across the North Atlantic in, with partnerships in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, uh, Greenland, Iceland, uh, Scotland, and Norway. The opportunity there is that the Arctic is, is, is warming, it's melting, it's going to open up, and that's going to create enormous challenges from an environmental stewardship point of view, uh, as well as real opportunities. So that's what you can expect over the next few years. So I want to shift now to the climate question, because it, it really is a, 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 an, an overarching uh, challenge for us, and in some ways an opportunity. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the, the world's oceans. 99% of the world's oceans. We are on the bleeding edge of the climate change challenge in the ocean. This, this map here, red shows areas that are, are warming faster than average. Blue shows areas that are, warm, that are warming slower than average. There's a lot of variability from one ocean region to the next, but we're on the forefront. In the last 30 or 40 years, uh, what you see here, the jagged line, is annual uh, sea surface temperature, which goes up and down. You have a warm winter, you have a cold winter, there's variability. The dotted line is the global ocean trend. We're, we're warming worldwide at about a hundredth of a degree centigrade. Um, doesn't sound like much, but added up over a century, it's very significant. The solid line is what's happening here in the Gulf of Maine, four times the global average. And in the last uh, 10 years, the red line indicates the acceleration of this warming. So we really are out there experiencing a rate of change uh, unlike most places in the world. And it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's, there's some grimness to this. It's, it's a sobering reality. The flip side is that it, it's, it's, a, it's a real opportunity in terms of, of learning how to deal with this challenge before others do and, and being able to export uh, that kind of know-how uh, to other places. We, we have the blessing of... A, of of living in a, in a laboratory of global significance here. Down on the dock, uh, the challenge is, what's, what's our future? If my family's been earning a living lobstering or ground fishing for the last 100 or 200 years, you know, what's my future as, a, as an isolated uh, uh, coastal community? 
And the first step here is, is we, we need to recognize that, that our incredibly productive uh, lobster uh, resource sooner or later is going to start to come down as the ocean warms up. Uh, these are some modeling results that we've done in the last couple of years that shows that we hit peak abundance four or five years ago. Uh, it, it takes lobsters seven or eight years to mature to market size. And so we're going to start seeing um, uh, the annual uh, harvest of lobsters come down a bit. The good news is it's, it doesn't look like it's going to be catastrophic, uh, but, but it's just a serious challenge that we have to look straight, straight in the eye uh, and, and figure out how to get ahead of it while supporting um, uh, the continued success of the lobster industry. And so it's a, it's a real challenge. Uh, the beautiful thing about lobstering is you can start uh, as soon as you can row a boat, you can make a few dollars with a few traps, buy, a, buy an engine, uh, save a few, save a work in the summer, make some more money, get a bigger boat. By the time you're in high school, you can be earning more money in the summer than your teachers earn working nine months of the year. And by the time you're in the 20s, you can be earning uh, $150,000, dollars $250,000 a year. Uh, you get your own office, you work in a beautiful place, uh, you set your own hours. Um, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal thing in very isolated communities along the coast. So the way I kind of kind of muddle my way into this is I start with, with the numbers. Uh, this, this, these are the landings for New England in 2016. And in 2016, we, we harvested about $1.2 billion worth of seafood. As you can see, the preponderance comes from Maine, a little over 50%. About 40% comes from Massachusetts, uh, and the rest is uh, uh, from the other three states. Lobster is the, is the largest uh, harvest at, at uh, about $540 million. Uh, most of it's here in Maine. And, and so the question is, is that, is that, as that harvest goes down, uh, what do we replace it with? What do we diversify into? And the good news is that, that scallops, oysters, mussels, and salmon uh, offer an opportunity uh, to, 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 to get on with. Um, we're sitting right on the, on the um, the, the opportunity end of the, the global aquaculture trend. Over the last uh, uh, several decades, aquaculture has been growing worldwide. In the last seven or eight years, wild fisheries have started to decline, and we expect those trends to, to continue. And so the, the growth of fish protein, the people that are going to feed fish to the world, are going to do it increasingly by growing those fish. Oops, excuse me. And, the, and the, 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 the opportunity we have here in Maine is that we've got uh, cold water, relatively speaking. It's clean, lightly populated, incredibly uh, productive. We're close to major markets. Uh, this coast, if you stretch it out, is 3,000 miles long, 3,000 miles long. When you scrunch it together, it offers all kinds of variability and shelter, unique uh, chemistries in the water. Um, and we're only using two hundredths of percent two hundredths of percent of those waters for aquaculture. So when you start thinking about growing aquaculture, it's not going to take a huge amount of space. It's about, it's about strategy and, and focus. We have a, 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 a remarkable network of research institutions ranging from the Down East Institute in Washington County to the University of Maine in Orono, in Franklin, in, the, in uh, Walpole, the Bigelow Lab in East Booth Bay. Uh, the University of New England down in Biddeford and Portland, and of course GMRI here. And these, each of these institutions have their own unique niche. They know their local ecosystem, and they're a great resource for the aquaculture industry. In parallel, we have a, an array of community organizations strung along the coast. Uh, the Copscook Bay Resource Center down in Lubeck, uh, the Down East Institute uh, on Beals Island, um, the main, uh, main Center for Coastal Fisheries in Stonington, the Island Institute, in Rockland, Coastal Enterprises in Brunswick, again, GMRI uh, here in Portland. Each of these institutions are, are deeply rooted. They know their communities. They know the individual fishermen and entrepreneurs and bankers and whatnot in their communities. And so they're, they're well positioned to assist with, with facilitating the technical support and um, business development that's going to have to happen uh, to grow the aquaculture industry. And then the new addition, uh, which many of you are aware of, is Focus Maine. Um, three or four years ago, a group of, of leading CEOs uh, uh, here in Greater Portland, uh, co-chaired by Andrea Chinquette Maker, who's sitting over here, and Mike Dubiak, who I don't think is here. But Andrea and Mike uh, got together with, with uh, 
10 or a dozen peers, and uh, 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 developed the idea of, of, of through, through work with McKinsey and Company, of identifying free signature industries to focus on promoting the, to create job opportunities here in Maine. Uh, the first is, is to become a renowned uh, producer of high quality, traceable uh, agriculture and aquaculture products. The second is to, to uh, build a world-class pharmaceutical development and manufacturing environment. Uh, and the third is to um, attract, foster, and grow knowledge workers. And so they're the areas that they focused on. And of course, we were delighted to see them settle in on aquaculture and bring their, their resources, their leadership, uh, and focus. Um, the aquaculture side of this effort, uh, Bill Karen, who many of you know from Maine Health, he's, he's, he volunteered to work with us on the aquaculture side and brought us and, and uh, the Maine Aquaculture Association together to, to, to provide the, the expertise to, to get on with, with growing the aquaculture industry. And, and we're, we, we've got three major initiatives. The first is to um, accelerate the growth of small aquaculture businesses. So how do you, how do you make the leasing process more efficient to, to get into the business? How do, you, how do you get access to capital and, and business advice? The second is to recruit large aquaculture uh, firm investment from, from outside the country, from outside the, the state or country. Uh, and the third is to facilitate access to capital and risk management solutions. Unlike agriculture, it's very difficult to get insurance in the aquaculture business, and so there's some real challenges in terms of access to capital and then risk management. I want to just talk about the, the different species uh, and their opportunities because this kind of happens out of sight for most of us. Uh, salmon, we've all watched the, the, the kind of political debate about salmon over the last 30 years, and a thing I want to highlight with you is in the last 10 or 15 years, the production of salmon has become uh, best practice in, in, in uh, uh, this country, in Canada, Ireland, Norway, uh, New Zealand, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fabulous product from a healthcare point of view. Uh, here in Maine, uh, salmon grow well east of Mount Desert Island. And in the last 10 years, a company, a, a Canadian company called Cook Aquaculture has acquired all the existing uh, aquaculture leases and, and quietly developed a, a, a very successful salmon business. This is a picture of three net pens down in Eastern Bay near Jonesport. And you're probably squinting, saying, where are those net, net pens he's talking about? One of Cook's uh, uh, innovations was the shift from the rectangular uh, aluminum pens that came from Norway that st stood out like a, a sore thumb to these round, uh, black, kind of organic shapes. They look like a ledger and island, and, and so the, the, the neighborhood impact of these, these, uh, these facilities has gone down. An indicator of this is that in Jonesport two summers ago, Cook applied for a lease. They had their public hearing, and you know, think about Jonesport. It's not a place that's known to be uh, hospitable to outsiders. And, um, uh, and at that public hearing, there was no public opposition no public opposition to a, the lease for a salmon farm. And what that comes out of is Cook's been a good neighbor. Uh, they help people out when they get in trouble. They move your mooring if you need some help. And this is one of those quiet success stories uh, uh, that has a lot of potential. Oysters, we all uh, know about oysters. Um, I, was, uh, I was talking with um, uh, uh, ben from the, uh, the chamber staff uh, before and, uh, the, the, this morning, and he said, yeah, I grew up down uh, near Walpole in the Damariscotta River, and when I was a kid, there was just one oyster farm down there, and now the whole river's full of oyster farms, and you know, they're, they're world-class oysters, and he's right. Uh, uh, the Damariscotta River is, is ground zero for the, the oyster industry here. In the last 10 years, we've seen a proliferation, the green dots, uh, both to the east and the west. Uh, here in Casco Bay, we've got Basket Island, uh, oysters, we've got um, flying point oysters. Uh, they're, they're, they're a fabulous product. Um, uh, just, just to the west in Scarborough, we've got the Nunsuch Oyster Company. This is Abigail Carroll. And, and what we have going for us here in Maine is clean water, lots of different little micro ecosystems, so different salinities, different nutrient mixes, and they, they, they give a different taste to each oyster. And, and the expression of, 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 of the, the, the meroir of, of oysters is kind of in vogue. Uh, uh, they're a premium quality food that has a lot of nuance, and we have a, we have a fabulous opportunity to grow this niche. Mussels, uh, mussels grow everywhere along the coast of Maine. Uh, uh, and uh, so it's a great environment to grow them in. 
Um, we have two uh, uh, notable mussel farms here in Casco Bay. Uh, Bangs Island mussel is one. Uh, Matt and Gary Moretti, uh, uh, father and son, uh, are deeply committed to a high quality product and, and, and their, their mussels are, 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 are better than any. We also have Calendar Island uh, mussels. Uh, owned by Peter Stocks, which is another great mussel company. And we're seeing the, the slow expansion uh, down the coast of mussels. And there's immediate demand, immediate un unmet demand uh, in the country for mussels, and, and a, another good opportunity. Then there's kelp. Then there's kelp. And, and uh, kelp is uh, being grown in a handful of places along the coast, uh, ocean approved, uh, a company called by, uh, founded by Paul Dobbins, you, you probably have heard of. And they've been promoting kelp as a as a, a very nutritious um, uh, food source. You can buy it on the shelf down at, at Whole Foods. The great thing about kelp is it only takes six months to grow. Other species of, 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 of shellfish take, uh, or finfish, they take two or three years. Did I hear somebody laughing about kelp down here? I was just saying to my friend that she could add it to her quinoa. <laughs> there you go. That's great. It's great on your oatmeal. It's great on your oatmeal. <laughs> So, so the beautiful thing about kelp is it only takes six months, and those six months are November to May, which is a perfect complement for the lobster season. And then there's scallops. Uh, scallops are harvested commercially, small amounts, $7 million a year of scallops harvested commercially uh, by Dragger along the coast. Uh, we've got a uh, main scallop company uh, here in in Casco Bay that's on the forefront of figuring out how to grow scallops uh, 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 hung on lines. Uh, there's a, there are a couple. There, there are companies in um, in Penobscot Bay, Frenchman's Bay, Blue Hill Bay, and this represents a huge opportunity. If you noticed on my uh, slide about New England fisheries, there was about uh, uh, 250 or 300 million dollars worth of scallops landed in the Bedford, and we have an opportunity uh, over time to be an alternative source, a predictable source, uh, and the scallops that are grown right now. Uh, uh, in pre-production are, are fabulous from a taste point of view, from a freshness point of view. And then, the, then the, the fascinating new opportunity is RAS, recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, what this is, is, is growing uh, fin fish, right now I'm going to talk about salmon, in big tanks that are on land and totally recirculating, so they don't interact with the, the, the wild environment. There's a, a company going through the startup phase right now, uh, to build one such facility in Bucksport at the old Champion Mill site. If you think about paper mill sites around the state uh, that have proximity to water, uh, substantial electricity and sewage treatment capability, um, this is a potentially a, a, a phenomenal uh, opportunity. It's the industrial production of, of premium quality fish. Um, these are engineering uh, 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 drawings. It takes, uh, this is a very sophisticated business. It's capital intensive. To get into the business costs 50 or 100 million dollars, uh, uh, and then you have to wait for years for your first uh, uh, salmon to come to market. So, it's 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 early, and the great thing about this is Maine is uniquely positioned uh, to to welcome this industry into industrial uh, 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 sites that are that are looking for whatever their future might be. So. That's what I wanted to kind of uh, spread out in front of you here. And I, I want to bring it back to ground, which is um, we have an opportunity here in Maine to, to really transform uh, our coastal economy. Uh, this aquaculture opportunity is real, uh, and it's, it's, it's very human scaled. Um, uh, one of the things that got me focused on this was four or five years ago, we were talking with one of the oystermen here in, in Casco Bay. And, he said, you know, he said, you're, you're not a real oysterman until you've lost a million oysters. And everybody kind of chuckled uh, at the humor of that. And as I started thinking about it, I said, man, that, that's a real problem. Uh, you know, how many people can afford to lose a, a million oysters? And so the, the, the thing we're focused on, and, and with the benefit of Focus Maine's uh, support, is, is how do you break through that? How do you, how do you provide the know-how, uh, the business supports, uh, so that those entrepreneurs uh, can be sex can be successful predictably and quickly, uh, that they can meet their production schedules, that they can be hiring their first employee, their fifth employee. And there are examples of, of oyster companies and mussel companies up and down the coast that are doing that. So what I would encourage uh, you all to do is, uh, uh, when you go out to lunch or dinner and decide to buy fish, uh, ask where that fish came from. And if it didn't come from Maine, uh, uh, encourage them to serve it. 
If you go to your corporate or university or hospital, uh, hospital cafeteria, ask them where the fish came from uh, and encourage them to, to, to provide fish that's being grown responsibly and, and uh, 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 productively here in Maine. Uh, and, and look for ways to support uh, this industry. Many of you live in coastal towns. There'll be some young, uh, courageous entrepreneur that, that you'll read about in the paper who's going to apply for a lease to grow mussels or scallops uh, down the road. Uh, you know, meet them. Uh, show up at the public hearing. Give them support because this represents change and, and it's going to take support from all of us to, to really make it work. So with that, um, I'd be happy to take some questions. And I think there are microphones out there for questions. Who is, hello, okay. Good With morning. the current administration in place um, in the White House, do you feel that your project, your, your business, your, your vision could be impacted by rules and regulations they put in place? Yeah, so, um, so the, obviously the political environment is, is challenging and uncertain for all of us. Um, and the way we've approached that is that w when you step away from the political debate, this problem is real. Uh, you talk to any fisherman, they're seeing these changes out in the water. We're out on the water uh, every year, we're seeing the changes. You walk down the beach, you find a seahorse on the beach. Uh, 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 so these changes are real. And so we're focused on the change. How do, we, how, do we, how do we understand those changes? And what's, what's, how do we solve it here locally where we have some control? And from that point of view, our, our view is, you know, these are real problems. They're not going to go away. We, they're going to have to be solved. And it, it, we're just going to stay focused on the problems. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is James. I do the business development and philanthropic donations for Clark Insurance. Uh, <clears throat> my question actually comes from uh, an event I attended in the summer, uh, shout out to Jess Knox, it was the main startup in Create Week. And there was a speaker who uh, did the bold decision of breeding eels uh, inland under the guise of, of aquaculture. And it kind of got me thinking about the question of all those graphs you showed were, were coastal, um, which is logical, but I'd, I'd like to hear your opinion on the, the difference of, of coastal aquaculture versus inland aquaculture, and if that's, you know, the goal, if that's just a big dream, or what, what's your opinion about that? That's a, that's a great question. So um, the, the slide I did on, on RAS, recirculating aquaculture systems, uh, that technology could be used for, for eels uh, uh, just as well as for salmon or other fin fish. And so, um, th th I mean, th we, we have enormous capacity in inland Maine, and there's real need for job opportunities. Um, the, 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 the challenge is that is the, tech, the technology and the know-how for growing eels or growing salmon or growing other fin fish uh, in total captivity is early stage, and so it's risky. It takes, it, it takes uh, people who are brave and, and committed. Um, there's a woman who uh, is, has been uh, working on growing eel, eels down in Walpole. Her name's Sarah Rademacher. She just uh, won a national business plan uh, conference for her for her, uh, for her eel business. Uh, so it's happening here, and it's a, it's a great question. Morning, Jerry. Morning, John. Um, the question to you is, in the beginning of your presentation, you had a, a slide that showed six columns of the six New England states, and of course, Maine led the pack with lobster landings. However, there was over a million lobster landings in Connecticut, and some of us have read over time in the last couple of years that there is a virus or something that's affecting the lobsters down in the Rhode Island and Connecticut shoreline. Is that is that coming this way, or is what what's what do you know about that? Yeah. So as as many people have probably read, you know, ten or fifteen years ago there was a, a dramatic decrease in lo in lobsters in Long Island Sound, and it was a function of all the runoff um, uh, from the watershed into a very shallow enclosed body of water that stressed the lobsters. Temperature was going up. And all of a sudden, they're much more vulnerable to disease than normal. Uh, we have a very different environmental situation here in Maine. It's, it's really the opposite. We have deep water. We have uh, very dynamic currents. 
uh, lightly populated, water's clean. And so the risk of that kind of a, of a threat to the lobster industry is low. Uh, the industry and, and the state obviously watch very closely um, uh, to make sure that something doesn't uh, uh, occur, but, but it's, a, it's really a totally different uh, uh, environmental challenge. And, and uh, what happened down there is, is not likely to happen here. Hi, I'm Bryce Hawk with Maine Audubon. Just a quick Good question, kind of a follow-up from uh, what you mentioned with the Gulf of Maine, that it's uh, warming up not faster than 99% of the ocean. Kind of tied to that, what's the impact of ocean acidification and its role with uh, Maine fisheries? So, um, so ocean acidification happens as uh, we end up with more carbon dioxide in the air. Uh, it dissolves into the water and... and uh, and simplistically, uh, you end up with carbonic acid and a, and a slow acidification of the chemistry of the ocean. Uh, we've seen this um, as, a, as a notable impact in the, on the west coast of the United States, up in the Puget Sound area. Here in the Gulf of Maine, uh, uh, it's a relatively uh, minimal uh, threat at the moment. Uh, we see it way up in the bays, in the, shallow, uh, the shallows of the bays. but. Um, the, the combination of water temperature, salinity, fresh water coming down from the St. Lawrence and, and the Arctic, and the way currents work here, um, in the near term, ocean acidification is, isn't the challenge. It's warming and it's sea level rise. In the long term, uh, the chemistry uh, issue uh, is a challenge for all of us. And, and from our point of view, the first step there is to get sensors in the water. Uh, we have at the University of Maine and other entities here in Maine, we have a lot of expertise about how do you put low-cost sensors uh, in the ocean to, to monitor it. And a, a lot of this is about just understanding, you know, what, what cove, what island, what river is optimal and, and kind of using that knowledge. And so uh, this is a real challenge, uh, but I think it's one that, you know, we're, we're positioned to, to reckon with. Good morning. My name is Tae Chong. I'm with CEI. Um, and, you know, Americans' palates has changed so much in the last, you know, 40 years. I remember we didn't have salsa at our at our tables, you know, maybe 20 years ago, and now sriracha and salsa are some of the most popular condiments in America because our demographics is changing. And so in the United States right now, according to the U.S. Census, half of all the kids under the age of 18 are multicultural. What is Gulf of Maine or Focus Maine doing to prepare for the changing uh, palate, especially with seafood? Um, are the, the seafood that we have now that we're researching, is that going to meet the changing demographics, or are, are you researching that as, as we speak? That's a great question. So we at, at GMRI are not uh, uh, focused on, on product development. Um, our view on that one is that the, uh, the, the, fish, uh, the fishing industry, uh, the fish uh, processors and, and marketing side are keenly attuned to changing tastes. And so we've seen I mean, you know, products like, uh, like uh, kelp getting introduced. Uh, 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 I mean, th there's a significant market here in this country, and to your point, 20 years ago, uh, uh, there wasn't. Um, the uh, uh, oysters, uh, um, the people didn't eat oysters uh, uh, in recent years. All of a sudden, uh, that's a, um, uh, uh, an interesting opportunity. We're seeing fish get processed, not into go down and buy your whole fillet, but getting processed into meal size that, that are convenient for, for two-income families where somebody needs to buy a meal that's easy to cook and, and not uh, a challenge to cook. So I, I actually think the, 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 the fish processing and retail industry, are, are they're tightly attuned to changing tastes and, and are developing products to, to meet that. How are we doing on time? That's all the time we have for questions today. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. That was a uh, fantastic uh, presentation. We thank you for your leadership these many years uh, down on the, the Portland waterfront. Um, as always, you can stay up to date by connecting via Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Stay tuned to the Chamber's website for a video of this morning's eggs and issues. Just in time for hot stove season. I don't write this stuff. Uh, <laughs> but this is exciting.
Next month, we will be welcoming Sam Kennedy, President and CEO of the Boston Red Sox. If you're a baseball fan or interested in how a Major League Baseball team operates, I highly recommend uh, attending this event. Uh, please also join us for our newest event where we swap our eggs for kegs. Kegs and Issues will once again be held on December 11th at Aura Nightclub here in Portland. Melissa Smith, CEO of WEX, will be emceeing the event, and Ann Heroes, the Executive Director for the Center for Grieving Children, will be the presenter. Tickets are on sale now, and you should be receiving an email later this afternoon from the Chamber with details on the registration. Uh, thank you for attending this morning. We will see you December 6th for Sam Kennedy's presentation at the next Eggs and Issues. Have a great day.